and have an abnormal gait. Um, chronic hydrocephalus is, it takes over years, it's slow progression, and again, in children, because their <coughs> sutures aren't closed, you can have the large heads. And uh, you know, this is an extreme, but you know, it, it, we live in a rural area and we see these patients. Um, other signs of hydrocephalus, uh, because the fontanelle is open, you feel on the fontanelle, if it's soft, it's fine. And I always say, compare the fontanelle to the tip of your nose. That should be normal. If, it's, if, if the fontanelle is stiff, stiffer than the tip of your nose, there's something abnormal. That's a way to be able to see if there's a problem there. And again, other signs, uh, abducens, palsies, and these are the old classic signs of sunset. That means that the kid's eyes are retracted because they're putting pressure on the tectum, their eyes are deviated down, and this is the way these patients look. They look, they look like they're looking down. Uh, okay. And again, in older patients, headache, vomiting, altered mental status, and then once their, their cortex doesn't get enough blood, then they can have strokes. So here, the, the pressure is building up in the brain. And uh, you got, you remember the last topic, I had a box. In the box, there was blood, brain, and spinal fluid. If spinal fluid is overproduced, there's less blood flow getting to the brain, and the box is pushing the brain away. The brain is, is there, but it's being compressed. And depending on the amount of time, and here you can see some edema, injury to the brain, just white stuff like that. Papilledema is another sign. Every time I see papilledema, I'm like, oh, ophthalmologist. It's very hard to find someone to be able to do a full exam without dilating their pupils. Again, this is not a neurosurgical emergency, but I'll explain why there is one indication for neurosurgery. Um, hem intracranial hemorrhage is usually hypertensive, and these patients are usually um, older patients, and it's because of problems in the blood vessels. Okay, uh, These are older patients, 80-year-old 80, 80 patients, something called uh, uh, Charcot-Bouchard aneurysm. These are aneurysms that are just dil dilated next to the thalamus. And what happens here, the the layers of the arteries start becoming very thin. Amyloid is an abnormal protein that gets deposited there, and then the arteries can expand. For instance, if your blood pressure goes up a little bit, your arteries can compensate by squeezing down or opening up depending on the pressure. In patients who have amyloid, these arteries are stiff. And so what happens, these patients can have hemorrhages. Um, not in a neurosurgical emergency. This is in the thalamus. Another one in the thalamus. This is in the brainstem, in the medulla. This is a neurosurgical emergency. The difference here is this is a CT scan of the head, frontal lobes, parietal lobes, occipital lobes, the ventricles. This hemorrhage, in order for me to go and take this out, I have to go through normal brain on the left side. Can't do that. On the right side, well, I could do that, but this is the thalamus. This side is the right side, controls the left side of your body. So if I go in there, and take this out, I'm going to cause damage. Why? Why, why would I cause damage? Well, first of all, when you have a hemorrhage, this doesn't mean that all this tissue is dead. It means that the blood is there causing pressure, and once the swelling goes down, you might have some improvement neurologically. So a small hemorrhage like this does not need surgery. This hemorrhage right there in the, the, the pond, first of all, the location of it is inaccessible, and if we go try and chase that, we're going to make the patient worse. So these hemorrhages do not need surgery. This one does. This is in the cerebellum. This is in the posterior fossa. Here, this is the medulla, part of your brainstem. This hemorrhage is putting pressure there. This hemorrhage is close to the surface. We can evacuate this. The patients wake up. Of all the other bleeds, this is the only one that needs surgery. Well, if the patient develops hydrocephalus, then we need to do the catheter in here, the ventriculostomy, and all that stuff. But this is the patient that will die if we don't address this. So if you ever have a patient that has a bleed and they talk about cerebellar bleed, we need to be notified because this is a patient that will do well. The cerebellum controls some of your movement, ambulation, some of the finer move movements. But the, the thing is, your brain has the capacity to readjust. You can remove part of this, part, this small little cortex there, remove the clot, and have very minimal deficits compared to death.
and this is a pathology slide. This is in the thalamus. This ruptured, this was a, a Charcot Bouchard aneurysm. It ruptured into the ventricle. And if you see, this is something that we can't operate. But there's other things we can help them. We can place a ventriculostomy catheter. Ventriculostomy catheter, this is a good picture. So the skull is here. I have to drill through the skull and blindly. And, and I'm saying blindly because I don't see the catheter. But I use anatomy um, uh, locations to show me where I'm, where I'm at. So by landmarks, I know where this catheter is. So I have to place this catheter here, and I can drain spinal fluid. Because this is in the ventricle right there. This area right here is where spinal fluid can be drained. The clot is too thick, but we can do TPA. We can do TPA in the ventricles. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Ampor and myself like using TPA, and we, we used it uh, last month. Again, intracranial hemorrhages, many causes of hemorrhages. Uh, ruptured AVMs, AVM means arterial venous malformation. That is an artery that drains into a vein. In, uh, in some patients, they have those, and if it ruptures, it uh, resects it easily if it's a simple aneurysm, uh, AVM. Um, AVMs can be very deep in the brain and can have a lot of complications. Patients can die from AVM surgery. Rupture aneurysm, we talked about it. Trauma. The most common cause of intracranial hemorrhage is trauma. Subarachnoid hemorrhage from trauma is the most common cause of hemorrhage. Other problems. Tumors. Again, this is leukemia. Anemia. Liver disease. Hypertensive crisis. Septic emboli. Uh, we talked about abscess, but also what happens with the uh, emboli, they go and they can cause something, a mycotic aneurysm. Mycotic is a misnomer. Mycotic means fungal. But usually these aneurysms are from bacteria. And these are distal uh, aneurysms that rupture into the cortex. Again, hemorrhagic infarcts. What is that? It's an ischemic infarct that transforms into hemorrhagic. Uh, someone who has a stroke without a bleed, and this usually happens to a patient who had TPA, that the stroke with the reperfusion can have a hemorrhagic infarct. Vasculitis, amyloidosis, this is what I talked in the older, uh, spoke about in the older patients. Hypertensive hemorrhages. Um, again, 90% of the patients say that they were calm and still. This is when the blood pressure shot up. This is a, a, a number that I usually say, a, a clot volume less than 30 cc has a good outcome. Those clots were bigger probably won't survive as well unless it's in a different location. Location has everything to do with survival of a hemorrhage. Um, evacuation of a clot. The only time we talk about it if, if, if the clot is in a non-eloquent area or if it's in the cerebellum that can be removed. Small clots in the cerebellum that measure t less than 30 cc's don't really cause a lot of pressure. So they could be a small hemorrhage. But if it's causing pressure and causing hydrocephalus, <coughs> surgery is an indication. Sites, um, again, internal capsule, putamen, white matter, thalamus. And these are uh, some clinical findings. Uh, again, before MRI and CT, we had to look for this. And, and this is the way we diagnose them. Um, they have putaminal hemorrhage, eyes look toward the lesion. Um, if it's in the white matter, eyes look toward the lesion. In the thalamus, Downward deviation of the eyes, cerebellar hemisphere, opposite side. The palms, those little pupils are fixed and dilated. Correction. Those the small fixed. Yes. Um, just a quick question. Um, I've been kind of given the impression over the years that um, an aged population tends to survive intracranial hemorrhages or bleeds better than younger people do. I've been told that's just because of brain after there's more room in the cranium. Is that true? Yeah, it, it is true. Um, younger patients usually have other problems going on. Um, and the younger patient is usually associated to, for instance, uh, cocaine use or other things. And then what happens is, like, like you said, in the box, and I'm going back to a model I talked last week, if you have brain atrophy, it means that the brain is shrunken, you have more space for the brain to be able to be shifted. And someone who's younger, as, as, as younger, the younger you are at babies, have no space. A small epidural can cause a lot of problems. In an old patient, large epidural, a subdural, probably is asymptomatic. And again, it's because of the size of the brain and the compliance of the brain.
Uh, brain herniation syndromes, I talked about this last time. Um, again, it's, uh, it happens because of changes in, in, in pressure. Um, you have a mass effect pushing on the brain, it will cause a subpulsing herniation, uncle herniation, and, and tonsillar herniation. Um, and then central, if someone gets central herniation, that's actually one of the worst herniations. Because these, by removing the blood clot, you can help. If you have a big tumor that's pushing down here, it's much harder to take out. And, and this is a past slide I showed last time. This is uncle herniation pushing on the mid midbrain. This would give you the uh, unilateral blown people. Um, but if there's enough pressure, it will give you, and this will give you a contralateral hemiparesis. But if it pushes enough, it will give you ipsilateral. So um, some of the older signs are much harder to use depending on, again, with new technology, MRIs and scans, we can be more accurate. Um, these are the slides I was telling you about. The uh, edema, cytotoxic, um, is usually in head injury. And here, the difference is the blood barrier is not disrupted. In a CT scan and uh, an MRI, there is no enhancement. That means just T2 changes, just swelling in the brain. And the cells uh, swell and then shrink versus ischemic. And this is someone who has a stroke. The blood barrier, blood brain barrier is closed, but then opens once the cells start having going into dying. Extracellular space shrinks and then expands. So less blood flow going to that part of the brain will shrink it, and then once the stroke starts, the cells start dying, then it starts expanding. This is the one that is caused from tumor. And the blood brain barrier is disrupted. There is enhancement. And this is the type of edema that only responds to steroids. And it's only around tumors. The last time we had, I had a question, so I made these slides just to be able to, to point out the differences between the types of edema. Our best friend here, the hated ventriculostomy. Um, <laughs> Again, the ventriculostomy is, it, it's, it's complex, but it's functional, it's simple to use once we understand water dynamics. Um, what this is, is a column of water. Um, this catheter goes into the brain. The brain has a certain pressure. Normally, it's less than 25 millimeters of mercury. And what happens here is this column of water would be at the height of the external, uh, external auditory canal, and then we can regulate the buretrol, this thing, to see how much we want to drain. If we would have, again, this is a ventriculostomy catheter, this is the other type of catheter. If we drop this below the patient's head, the head's up here, if we drop this, we do a negative pressure, siphon. And this is what we do when we siphon. We can cause a subdural hematoma. Overdrainage of ventriculostomy can cause headache, but the problem is it can also cause subdurals. So ventriculostomies are something to always be concerned about. And if you're in, in doubt, again, if anybody's moving your patient, close it. If the family is moving around, explain to them they can't move the patient around, they can't lift the head up or anything. Easiest thing to do, if you're not in the room and too many people, close it. And there's ways to do this, where you can drain 10 to 15 cc's an hour. That means you're in the room, you open, you drain, and you leave. And we give you the orders for this. But Sometimes if you tell us there's a lot of things going on, um, the pulmonologist, the, the uh, intensivist is doing the rotatory bed thing and all that stuff. Do we have one here? Mm -hmm. Rotor, okay. Yeah. When they're doing the rotatory bed and head injuries, that's when it starts getting complicated. And that's when you have to say, hey, we need more things. We have to make sure how to be able to take care of a ventriculostomy catheter because therapy is involved, the patient is in the rotatory bed, families are crying around, moving the bed up and down. Yeah. All these things can hurt our patient, and our patients can die with a simple ventriculostomy that is not managed properly. Okay, references. This is the uh, Bible of neurosurgeons. It is the, it's called the, a handbook of neurosurgery, and this is what all neurosurgery residents carry in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Uh, it's a lot of material, but in this, in, in your handout. Uh, a lot of the things can be reviewed in there. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr.